<laughs> so at this point in De Bello Gallico, you know, we've covered the first few chapters of book one, and we have to get to this point where Caesar is basically going to start a war, which leads us to some very important questions that we have to tackle. I don't know if you guys remember, um, at the beginning of the year, I gave you a sheet that had some sort of, um, it said like essential themes and questions for AP. And I took that straight from the AP guidebook. And one of the themes that uh, we have to talk about all throughout the year is called this, War and Empire. And some of the essential questions that the AP board expects you guys to be able to answer in an essay include these. These are like super, super huge topics. Why do wars happen? Wow. What are the consequences of war? <laughs> Positive and negative, maybe. So here's what I want you guys to do. Um, in your, your little groups that we talked about here, um, I want you to talk for about three minutes, spend about a minute and a half on each one, and I need one person in each group to sort of be the, the scribe of the group, write some things down, oh, and the noses go flying, right? <laughs> and then the other person needs to be sort of the reporter. And at the end of three minutes, we're gonna have a sort of broader discussion where maybe we can debate some of these things. Why do wars happen? What are the consequences of war? All right, you know your groups. I'm gonna start the timer in my head. <laughs> are you ready? Are you ready? Go. Why do wars happen? Just generally speaking. John. So um, we came up with, I think, four major reasons why wars happen. Four. The first one is territorial disputes. So just like one side thinks that they ought to have this particular territory for, you know, like they're, they're sort of entitled to this territory, so they want to get it. Um, second is resource disputes. So um, like going to war to gain resources, uh, Okay. The third is political reasons. So, like disagreements between the two uh, countries, well, and also for like, in, for like, in, like domestic stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, their glory and like, domestic support. Um, domestic support. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. All right. And what was the fourth one? Uh, like moral disagreements. So like, oh, interesting. So like, part of what this war was based on, something like, disagreeing with uh, a moral position, or like going to war in like different places to help people, like minorities or other sorts of people in the country. Okay. okay. So bringing up the American Civil War as an example, a moral disagreement over slavery right, between North and South. Okay. Excellent. Now. Uh, I have a feeling that probably some of you guys came up with similar reasons. So John, any differences? So we had a or couple other reasons. We had a couple other reasons. Those yeah. ones were very big, and especially, I think we can include in moral disagreements like beliefs, so religion, the Crusades, and all of those things. Okay, that would okay. definitely be a major part of moral disagreements. A lot of those kinds of things happen. Help me. Uh, what color is that? Pink. Is it pink? Okay. <laughs> Someone told me, I wasn't sure. So this little tiny nub right here was the Roman province of Gaul when Caesar was named the governor of Gaul. Okay, this little, just a little bit. He was also named the governor of another province. Does anybody remember from the summer reading, by chance, what the name of that province was? It's actually not on this map for some reason, but it is on this other map. You can see it back here. So this, he was also named the governor of this problem, province right here, Illyricum. And um, when he started his governorship, there were like some local tribes that were revolting in Illyricum. And so he thought, oh, that's where I've got to go. Because this little nubby province of Gaul, I don't care about that. What? Not a big deal. And so he was preparing in Rome uh, to raise a little army and go over here to Illyricum. When, as you guys know from earlier on in book one, what happened? Orgetorix. Orgetorix yeah. decided, member of what tribe? What was the name of the tribe? The Helvetii, very good, the Helvetians. They decided all of a sudden they're going to migrate, and they're going to migrate in such a way that where might they have to cross? Through 
through the little nubby bit of gall, right? And then this is the instance, because Caesar's all planning on going to Illyrica. This is what he's been planning for months. And then when he gets wind of this, he's like, oh, I've got to go over here and solve this little dispute or something. I don't know what's happening. And then before you know it, bam, 10 years goes by, and he's still in Gaul. And at that point, he's sort of like way up here in the northern part of Gaul. So uh, what is the exact reason why this war happened, do you think? Why does Caesar start this war with the Helvetians? Why does he care that a group of people wants to migrate to another part of Gaul? I mean, why? Because he wants to, they're going through his land. His land. They're going land. through his land, not their land. He also wants to get glory for himself by attacking someone. He wants to get glory by attacking someone and winning, maybe. Um, so glory was really, really important. Caesar had already been co-consul. And what happens when you're co-consul once? What do you want? To be again. You want to be co-consul again. That's be right. Marius. Yes. He wants the glory of his uncle Marius. And so how best to get it? Through military victory. So how do we know all this stuff that you're reading? Because who wrote it? Did anybody else write about this war? No. No. Maybe. We only know about Caesar. But we only know about Caesar, perhaps the consequence of war and the erasure of history. Did the Celtic tribes write stuff down? Of course they wrote stuff down. Did they probably have histories of this war? Probably yes, but we don't have any of them. The only account that we have is what Caesar wrote. And so we constantly have to ask ourselves, as a result of him wanting some personal glory, what exactly are we reading? I mean, are we reading history? Um, is it necessarily just a diary? Is it some sort of weird hybrid? Is some of this completely fictionalized? We really do have to ask ourselves these questions. They're impossible to answer, but we're gonna try. <laughs> All right, okay. So here's what I want you guys to do now. We had stopped at the beginning of chapter six, so let's take a look at the text. Either open your textbook or take a look at your the copy of the text that you printed out. And what I want you guys to do is get back into those groups. And we had covered all the way pretty much up to the semicolon. We talked about uh, how one path, uh, they only had two ways. The Helvetians only had two ways. And talk about the first path for me, Kyle. The first route that the Helvetians had to get to central Gaul. Describe that path for us. What? Uh, it was like really Yeah, it was really difficult and, and what's on goose do you remember? Narrow. 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 Because it, as you said, it's between like this huge mountain range and also between a river. A river. And um, the river, I don't know if we uh, quite got there, but the river is uh, really, the really river. deep. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Rodonis River is pretty deep. Now, the last part of the sentence, starting with Alterum, is going to describe the other path. This first part was a little tricky. I think the second part is not so not so bad. So here's what I want you guys to do. I want you to get into your groups, uh, turn your desks so that they're facing each other, and then uh, start to work through marking out the clauses of the main verb and whatnot. I'm going to give you guys about five minutes to go through this part of the sentence, and then we're going to regroup. See, there's going to do this a lot, where yeah. it's very compressed, and so there's like a hidden now that you have to understand for earlier in the sentence. So you are absolutely right. The other is okay, and then yeah. So that's it's very repeated um, and easy. And then okay, so here's what I'm confu confused by. So when it says um, "propteram yeah. quod interfines notori so this is obviously a clause of some sort because of you. This is like it's like a I don't know like support clause. That's um, right. But where would there be like where is, there isn't a verb in Greek, isn't it? Or are we missing it? Is it like Venus? Um, there is a verb. And you're right that that starts a clause. And so the, the clause is naturally going to end at the verb. So keep going through the sentence. Oh, wait, so is this all one clause? So should we. Can we do pair What does that start? That starts, it's. Um, is it a clause within a clause? It's a clause within a clause. 
Okay. Cool. Well, that makes sense because then the queen new pair of Kati Arad would be um, whatever. Okay. So yes, it says it goes. It goes through. Yes. Um, it goes through these two territories, the territories of these two people who are never peaceful, um, and over this river. Something, something, something. Okay. Okay. So, so, get to the moment. Yeah. Okay. The queen for Yes, but does that end there? But it's we, like can't, but we can't say that the Proctorian Accord Clause ends there because that is the main verb of that clause within the clause. So then this clause ends at transitor, which is the main verb of the clause. Yes. Very good. Very good. The first thing I want, uh, I want you to do, I want somebody to, to raise their hand and tell me uh, where are the prepositional phrases? Because there are some here. Raise your hand if you think that you found all of them. Uh, not all of them. Anybody want to raise your hand and tell me if you found some of them? Okay, Sophie. Uh, the per pro weekend restaurant. Per pro weekend. Good. What else? Did you get any others? Oh. Um, would it inter That's right. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, Kyle, did you find any others? No. You didn't? Good. Because there aren't any others. Yes. Okay. Now, um, are there clauses in this bad boy? Yes. Anyway. Yes. Many. We say yes. There are many clauses. Okay, where does the first clause start? Raise your hand if you figured out where the first clause starts. Graham, where does it start? So that's a pro terra. Pro uh huh. And where does it end? Uh, at transit with the end of the sentence. All the way to the end of the sentence. Yeah. Because we have to have a verb, right? Yeah. But within that clause, another one. there's another one, Morgan. Where does it go? So, let's talk about the big vows, the proteria quote clause. Uh, Graham kind of already hinted that the, you know, there's a verb here in transitor. Is there a second verb in that, in that big clause? Another main verb there, John? Uh, is it fluid? It sure is. It's fluid. Ooh. Nice. Okay. Now, inside the little baby clause, what is the main verb? What do you think, Ryan? Right? I'm so proud that you included Pakati in it as well, and not just a rot. Very good. Pakati er rot. Okay. Um, now, we've kind of uh, drawn a road map of sorts for our, our sentence. Uh, what is Alteru referring to? The other path. It's like an implied hidden word, right? So, um, who wants to give it a shot? Who thinks that they could translate just from alterum to expeditius? Just, just that little bit. Does anybody want to give it a shot? Any group? Felt fairly confident? Thank you, sir. Go for it. Um, so the other path, which runs through our province, um, we could say is very easy um, and unimpeded, or is very easy for many people. And I'm pretty sure it just says unimpeded. It's easy for many people because it is something along those lines. All right, this is what you have. You have the sense of it nailed down. So now what we have to do is try and get it as literal as possible, right? So, and the first part, bam, the other one through our province. I think that the word that maybe is throwing us off here is molto a little bit. Yes. And also, you know what these two words mean. But what happens when uh, adverbs end in I-U-S? Are oh, they positive it's more comparative? It's comparative. Ah, it's comparative. So, not necessarily easy, but it's easy. easier and, and less, or uh, more open. It's more, more unimpeded. More unimpeded, more unimpeded right? <laughs> or more open. <laughs> more open. And now what are we going to do with multo? What case is multo if it ends in an O? Ablative. Ablative.